Case Customer Creations is sponsored by Bits and Bits. Use the code JBates to save 10% off your next router bit or CNC bit purchase at bitsbits.com. All righty then. I, uh, I'm in the process of doing some rough milling for the base components to my daughter's workbench, which is going to be fun on many levels. Fun to build it, fun to interact with my daughter while, uh, after it's completed. Uh, but as I'm running through these through the planer, I'm done with the planer for just a second while it's on my mind. Let's go ahead and do a tool talk video on this particular planer. I like to do what I call tool talk segments on these machines as a way of me to just talk about the machine rather than what I would consider a tool review. This is not a tool review. In my opinion, a tool review goes through all the bells and whistles, specifications, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just simply talking about my experience with the machine. And a little while ago, I posted a picture of this on InstaFace, Face, Facegram, they're all connected, my Instagram page, um, and asked if you had any questions about this particular machine. The most common question by far wasn't necessarily this about this exact machine, but why did I switch to this from my Hammer A341? I had a Hammer A341 jointer planer machine, absolute beast of a machine. Uh, it was a 16-inch wide cutter, had plenty of power. It was a fantastic machine at jointing and planing. It was an incredibly annoying machine at switching back and forth. It's a combination machine. I got it when I had uh, a two-car garage shop. The space was a premium. And now that I have this larger shop, this is a 30 by 40 uh, pole barn, basically. And it's, it's space is no longer a premium. It got incredibly annoying, incredibly annoying, switching back and forth. Most of the time, because I'm a bonehead, where I have, you know, halfway through the project, I forgot a component for some reason, or I make a screw up and I have to recreate another piece, and it's unnecessary switching back and forth was really, really annoying. I never pursued selling it at all, but somebody else pursued purchasing it from me, and eventually I gave in. And I sold it, ended up spending a lot of money out of pocket to to switch to two dedicated machines, and... That's the reason why I no longer have the Hammer A341. Uh, questions on this particular planer, though. Uh, basically, the first question was, have I thought about figuring out a way to put some rollers or a shelf up here? Uh, no, in my opinion, I think that's kind of unnecessary because I don't care what shape the top of the planer is. I almost don't care if it has a sticker that says don't put anything on top of it. The Hammer A341 did have a sticker on the top that said, don't put any stuff on the top, if I'm not mistaken. And that's all I did was put stuff at the top, on top of it. Uh, this one right here has some bolt heads on the top of this dust shroud that prevents stuff from sitting flat. So it still rocks. I don't care what's on top of here. I'm going to put stuff on top. That's just the way I use a planer. Passing stuff along, stacking stuff up. I'm always going to do that. I don't think a roller system or a shelf of any kind would change the way I work with this. So I'm okay with, with just leaving it as is and putting stuff on top. I've always had a good opinion of Oliver. I do have a personal preference for planers that raise the table rather than lower the head. I find it much easier to gauge how much is being removed by the way of physics. It eliminates any lash in the screws. How do you find this planer on this subject? Uh, lash in the screws. Oh, first off, this is a fixed table planer. And in my opinion, in my opinion, that's definitely the way, the way to go. I know once you step up to the, the much larger machines, almost all of them have a fixed head and the table moves. This one's the opposite. The table is fixed and the head moves. And I personally prefer that because it allows you to do this. You set up a roller and it's a set it and forget it roller. If you have a roller system to help you outfeed and the table is constantly moving, it's almost pointless to even set up a roller. Unless you do something like an auxiliary bed, an auxiliary pass-through bed, where you just make this really long, giant bed that maybe you have to adjust a foot over it. I, I don't know. Anyway, this setup to where the roller stand can always be at the same exact height as the planer bed, planer table, in my opinion, is definitely the way to go. Uh, my very first planer was the DW735 DeWalt planer, and it had a fixed table. And I put some wing, uh, some some fold down tables on it, and I really really liked that. When I switched from that to the Hammer A341, a much larger machine, that was one thing that I really had to get used to and was quite annoyed with at first. And that is the table 
went up and down on that particular machine. And I found it to be annoying because, again, I can't figure out some type of roller system to outfeed. So, in my opinion, I would much rather deal with Snipe, which is basically going to be on every single planer, rather than have a table that is moving up and down and the head is fixed and you're a little bit less prone to Snipe in that regard. The Hammer A341, uh, I do remember that if I did not lock the table, I'd get some pretty bad Snipe, but if I did lock the table and as so long as the tables were waxed and, you know, as little friction as possible, you, you could nearly eliminate, probably do eliminate Snipe on the majority of those particular cuts. But I always ran a snipe board through regardless. So this is what I call a snipe board. And whatever your material thickness is, just grab any old piece of whatever off the shelf that is the same thickness to start with. And you run this through first. And I put a little paint on mine occasionally or a mark of some kind. Whatever I have handy to mark on it so I know that this is the snipe board. And I run this piece through first. That way snipe is on it. And then no gaps. Just keep feeding material through on the back side with no gaps in between each board. And then when you're running your last piece, the snipe board I always put back on here. And I grab it once again and put it through on the back side. So that way snipe isn't on the front of the first piece and it's not on the back of the back piece. All of the snipe will always be on this. And that works if you can, if, if the pieces are long enough and the speed is slow enough, to where you can physically, you know, you know, you're doing that in feed out feed dance, right? You're, you're you're putting material in as you're pulling off, grabbing another one, putting more in as you're pulling off. If you can do that without any gap in between your boards, well, then all the snipe's going to be on here, and you don't have to worry about any snipe on your boards. And at that point, uh, a planer that has a, a a the head that moves up and down is not a problem at all. Uh, again, I don't even really think it's a problem if, if, even if you don't use this. Uh, a lot of people just add a couple inches to each one of the boards just for snipe, right? Uh, so, if, for instance, if I'm building a, if I'm going to do, or when I do actually, I should say, because I'm building this workbench, when I do the top assemblies, I will most likely just account for three inches, two and a half, three inches on each end and say, yeah, snipe's going to be there. Who cares? Cut it off. So, if you're okay with, Working around snipe, in my opinion, having a fixed table height so you can dedicate a roller to outfeed is so, so handy. I really, really like this setup. I'd like to hear your thoughts on 15 inch compared to 20 inch. This is a 15 inch cutter head. Uh, do you ever wish you sized up? Is larger than 15 really just overkill for the regular shop? Thanks. So is <laughs> larger than 15 overkill for the regular shop? Uh, that's going to be kind of a loaded answer because anything larger than this, I use my four foot by 10 foot CNC machine, which probably is overkill for the regular shop. So, uh, <clears throat> the last machine that I had, the Hammer A341 was a 16 inch wide cutter head. And I don't recall how many times, I know it was very few times that I maxed out the width in either jointer or planer mode, if at all any. Um, it sounds weird to say that I never maxed out the width on those. I probably did a couple times, but that couple times, in my opinion, it doesn't justify going larger for what I do anyway. Um, and also, when you get it, when you're maxing out some the width of a of a of a cut, typically you're going to have a long piece anyway, and it gets to a point where it's just kind of hard to to manage a lot of really really big pieces through any one of these machines, whether you're running it over a jointer or a planer. Let's just say a 15, 16 inch wide piece that's four feet long, eight feet long, probably has some thickness to it. It's not going to be the easiest thing in the world for the most part. And there's easier ways, in my opinion, to do something like that. So I wanted to get down to a practical size that would cover like 99% of everything that I wanted to do. And if I had something that was much larger, let's just say a single a single glue up for a workbench top. Obviously, I can't fit it through here. And if I did, and if I could, it would be a, a struggle to do something that large. Well, in that case, for me, this isn't the tool to do it anyway. I would just put it on, on my CNC machine and flatten it. So that's more of a my situation thing. I have access to other means of flattening large stuff. So I'm not going to emphasize the, the ability to do it on this particular planer. So... Uh, that's kind of like, what, what are you doing with the planer? If you're doing a lot of, I don't know, 
18 inch by 30 inch cutting boards, that's a huge size, cutting boards or slabs or something that wide, well then your workflow will justify it. But for 99% of all the furniture that I've ever made in my life, 15 inch planer I think would be just fine. Three questions in this particular comment. What kind of blades does it take and how difficult is it to replace them? This is a carbide insert cutter head. And if there's any suggestion or advice that I could give anybody regardless of brand, if you can afford getting a carbide insert cutter head, do it versus the, the straight knife blades. In my opinion, it is definitely the way to go. Now, there's a spiral carbide insert or a or a uh, helical carbide insert. And that has to do with the angle of attack as it spins around, is it straight on or is it on an angle to more of a sheer cut? And I think they, the, the recommendation is that a helical head will produce better results, but I've had both and I can't, I, I can't tell any difference. So carbide insert is definitely the way to go for a couple different reasons. It's, it's a carbide insert, so it's an indexed type of a system. There is no setting the height of the blades every time you have to make an adjustment. It's simply you you, well, you clean it to make sure there's no gunk that gets down underneath them as you move them. But you re, you loosen the, the, hold, the hold down screw in the middle, twist it 90 degrees and lock it back in place. And you typically have four cutting edges, edges per carbide insert. So number one, you basically have four blades in one because you can rotate it four times, three times for four cutting edges. And then also the fact that they're carbide inserts versus more common high speed steel for the straight knives, they last way, way, way longer. My first uh, carbide insert cutter head was on a Grizzly G0490X, if I'm not mistaken. It was the eight inch Grizzly jointer that I had many years ago. Uh, I used it for two years very, very heavily. And when I sold it to upgrade to a larger machine, uh, they were still on the factory cutting edges. I never changed them and they were still getting really, really good results. Now, I keep that, keep in mind that I don't like to feed dirty wood through any of the machines. Dirt and heat are two enemies of anything sharp. So if you can clean off as much gunk on the surface of your material before you feed it through, your, no matter what blade it is, it's gonna last longer. Uh, so if I have any recommendation, carbide insert cutter head, whether it's a joint or a planer, pursue a carbide insert cutter head if it's within budget. Uh, so that's the first question. What is the power requirements? I, I don't know the exact amperage offhand, but it's just a simple 240 volt circuit. Uh, basically all of your larger power tools, all the, all the circuits for all your larger power tools are gonna be pretty much the same, so nothing crazy. Oh, I'm crying. <clears throat> I think I just inhaled a bug. <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> now that I'm crying, <clears throat> Do they make a mobile stand for it? Whew. <clears throat> a mobile, <clears throat> an auxiliary mobile stand is not needed for this because mobility is built, <clears throat> excuse me, built into the stand, built into the base. On the infeed side of the cabinet, inside is, <laughs> inside is two rollers, two wheels that go in that direction. And on the outfeed side is the exact same thing. However, there are some locking knobs or a locking knob for each wheel. And I believe that locking knob pushes onto a plate and that plate pushes into the wheel, stopping the mobility. Um, so with it locked on these two wheels, it stays put, it's not moving. It, however, this is light enough to where if I give it a good, you know, like a good hip check, uh, it's going to move <clears throat> in place. So if you need to move it around in your shop, you can loosen the locking knobs and it'll roll just like a train in one direction very easily. If you got to turn it, of course, you can lift up if you want to lift up and, and change the direction or whatever, or give it a hip check if you like hockey. Um, but it's a very, very, very good mobile base that is simple. The mobile base on my saw stop table saw, I've got the industrial mobile base on it. And that's without question the best mobile base I've ever used on any tools. However, it's kind of complicated. It's got a hydraulic jack to it. This is probably 95% of the mobility and 5% of the complication to actually implement it. It's a very, very simple system that works very, very, very well. Is there a noticeable cut quality from your previous planers? No. Not really. I, again, I think that has more to do with the type of cutter head 
than brand XYZ. The type of cutter head, this is a carbide insert cutter head, spiral or helical in my opinion, doesn't matter. They're both going to produce really, really, really good results. And something to take into consideration, how many times have you taken a board right off the planer and put finish on it? I'm, I'm almost certain that 99% of us on 99% of pieces will touch up that surface some way or another, whether it's, you know, hand planing or scraping or sanding. Odds are the, the surface right off the planer isn't the finished surface. So yeah, how's it compared to the cut quality from other planers? About the same. Does it have Wi-Fi? <laughs> no. And that is something that off topic, I, I just, I'm not for every little thing in life being connected to the internet. I mean, you go to Lowe's there and you see a refrigerator that has a screen that connects to Wi-Fi. No, stop doing that. A, a less connected world is better in my opinion. I hope that was a joke. No Wi-Fi on this particular machine. Here's a spicy question. What is your financial relationship with Oliver? That should explain lots. Um, I purchased these with my own money and I had to come out of pocket a little bit more from selling my last machine to get these two machines. So yeah. Are there any lifting points for moving it around the shop? How difficult was the delivery? No lifting points to move it around the shop. And I think I may have gotten this thing out of alignment, getting it into my shop. So no lifting points. I had to get this thing off of a pallet. And what I use to move tools off pallets or on and off my trailer is a Harbor Freight engine crane, engine hoist, cherry picker, a lot of different names. Uh, but I use that with a strap typically. So I put the strap underneath, underneath this uh, cutter head carriage assembly, the head of the machine. And I don't think you're supposed to do that, but I did that. And I think I probably got this thing out of alignment because when I got it up and running, one side was cutting 15 thousandths of an inch deeper than the other side. And I didn't call support or look in the manual or anything. I just, I kind of have a pretty good mechanical mindset of trying to figure out how things work. So my thinking was, well, if you twist this handle and all four corners of the machine raise and lower at the same amount, then there has to be some type of a connection between this cutter head assembly, this, this the head of the machine, and each one of these posts. And if there is, which there is, then what you can do is on the high side, you can loosen those connection points and then raise the cutter head. Therefore, the side that's still connected should raise at a faster rate as the side that I've disconnected or loosened. And then tighten these back down, make some more test cuts. That's exactly what I did. There's a couple screws or bolts uh, connecting each one of the corners to a nut of some kind to a threaded rod on the inside of each one of these posts. So I'm not saying that's how you calibrate the head parallel to the base, but that's what I did. And it's a very easy and quick adjustment. Um, and again, I, I think I did that by lifting it up. Uh, with a strap but otherwise I don't know how you would lift this up and that's an interesting uh, thing to bring up because when I talk about the jointer that I got as well the jointer is a much larger heavier machine it has integrated lifting hooks on the base of the machine and after using those oh man every tool manufacturer please listen if, if you are listening please include some type of dedicated lifting point whether it's a J hook whether it's a, a D ring some type of points into the base of your machines where it says, hey, it's safe to lift here. You won't mess up any calibration. I imagine that wouldn't cost much extra. And it's just such a easy, such a good peace of mind moving stuff around. Uh, because, you know, these machines, eventually you're going to have to pick them up and move them for the most part. Whether you sell it to somebody else or you're buying it from somebody else or you have to move it from one shop to the next. Ultimately, you got to lift these machines up at one point or another. Can you adjust the feed rate? Yes, you can. There's two feed speeds on here, 16 feet per minute and 20 feet per minute. The, the, the slower speed is typically what you would use for a better finishing cut. Although, like I said, you're never going to go from the machine right to finish. So you're going to address the, the surface anyway. But for figured stuff, for stuff that has the grain going in both directions, so part of the board you're planing downhill, part of the board you're forced to plane uphill, I can see where the slower speed will produce a better surface, less tear out. 
Um, but I always do it not for the quality of the surface, but just to keep up with the machine. If, if you know, you're working alone in your shop, it's you're, you're doing that in feed out feed dance where you're constantly stacking and feeding, stacking and feeding. It's hard to keep up when they're on their faster speeds. Uh, for example, this little batch that I did right here is not that much material, but a couple pieces are only 24 inches in length. And I think that's kind of like the sweet spot or the, 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 the optimal number for being able to constantly go real fast by yourself. Uh, less than 24 inches, you're really hustling to try and make sure you put another piece in as you're pulling one out. Um, for longer pieces, if you're doing a bunch of longer stuff, I will switch over to the faster speed because you can, I can keep up with it better, or more easy, I should say. Uh, and if there's two people running the machine, one person feeding, one person stacking, at that point, I can run tw the 20 feet per minute setting. But 99% of the time, I've been saying that a lot lately. Uh, the majority of the time, I leave it on the slower speed. A couple things that I do and do not like about this machine. This is one thing that I do like. It's a Wixi electronic digital readout accessory that is that, that comes with the machine. So you can put this on a lot of different machines, um, basically any machine, but this one comes with it. Once you calibrate it, it's pretty darn awesome to be able to say, I want 1.75 inches, run it through the machine, and you get 1.75 inches. This is accurate to five thousandths of an inch. Uh, so let's just say you go through and you make some other cuts. Obviously, it's at a different height, but you forgot one piece. You got to go back up to 1.75. I always overshoot and then come right back down. I find that to be the most accurate. So once I get back down to 1.75, we'll be right there. We'll be in the exact same spot. And I was looking at the handle. You weren't, but it's in the same spot. So uh, it's pretty cool to be able to return that at that exact value without running a piece through and measuring and seeing if you're at where you need to be. Uh, that's an absolute value. You can also do incremental adjustments to where you need to remove, I don't know, for whatever reason, if you wanted to track removing a tenth of an inch or something like that, you can start the incremental at one point, make your adjustment, and then cut as needed. I don't see that to be handy at all. So absolute is where I keep it and always use it. I really like this. I do like the on-off system, on-off switch with this machine. You know, the majority of your, your woodworking tools, your hands are occupied. You're, you're doing something. So if you have the opportunity to use your leg to shut it off, that's definitely the way to go. You know, uh, my saw stop table saw, I'm sure Powermatic and the rest of them, uh, they all have that paddle type off switch. So as you're pushing material through, you can use your thigh to shut it off your lower body to shut it off. My Laguna bandsaw has a foot brake. That brake not only stops the wheels from spinning the brake, uh, but it shuts the machine off. This, can you see it? Yeah, this machine right here, my, my jointer, has a foot off switch the whole length of the machine. Brilliant. I love being able to turn machines off with my thigh. It just makes so much more sense. Um, let me bring you in closer and there's a couple other features that I like about the implementation or the design, the layout of this on off button. All right, the machine is running and I need to shut it off. So I use my thigh to shut off the machine and now you can't accidentally bump into this and turn it on. The on, the on button is flush mounted and you have to push it into the machine to turn it on. Notice I can't turn it on right now uh, because after you turn it off, it's almost, well, it is impossible for you to accidentally come back and turn the machine back on. Now, again, most of these most of these machines have the same type of recessed on button. But one thing that I really like about this is if a kid is in here, and I say if because it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not going to let kids play around in here unsupervised. But let's just say somebody who shouldn't be pushing this button tries to push this button it's not going to start, as you can see, because I haven't deactivated the off switch. This is one of those twist locks, so every time you turn it off, you have to manually twist this to pop it back out, and then it will turn on. So it's just a little added safety that the majority of people who are not familiar with this machine won't understand how to turn it on, and I like that. There's two things that I kind of don't like about this machine, this dust port being one of them. So this dust port is a quarter of an inch shorter in length direction left and right than the shroud that it bolts up to so as you can see there's a little bit of a, a gap right here uh, i filled this gap with a uh, sized a piece of wood a little block of wood to fit that gap snugly and then i wrapped it in tape 
uh, black electrical tape and then wrap that tape around the inside so that the airflow goes in the same direction as the wrap and it should never ever ever come undone but without it i mean there's a quarter inch gap right here so i had some dust or some chips flying out of here that's kind of annoying it's a super easy fix no big deal it doesn't really affect the operation of it uh, i brought that to their attention uh, they were appreciative of my feedback so hopefully they uh, implement a change for future customers not a big deal but that was kind of annoying i would like to see that this this elevation handle relocated now that's not a, a specific situation to oliver um, the majority of other planers have this elevation gear or elevation handle on this particular post i think it would be better if this handle elevation mechanism was moved to this post. I don't know if that changes some internals. I don't know, but I would love to see this over here. And the reason being is this handle is kind of big and bulky and, and up here. So as I'm doing that that dance, like I said, back and forth, in feed and out feed, I find myself whacking into this handle a lot. Now that's a me thing. Just move your hand, you big goon, right? Well, if, if there was one thing that I would like to see changed on this machine, it'd be to move this handle back here. One last thing before I close out this video, and that is why did I purchase these machines from Oliver instead of spending a little bit more money from Powermatic or saving a little bit to buy from Grizzly? Uh, well, as far as the money side of things, this purchase was at the top of my budget. I had to stretch it just a little bit <laughs> to uh, buy these two machines. So anything more than that was just financially out of the question. Um, I could have saved a little bit by going th uh, through Grizzly, buying from Grizzly, but it was a supply chain issue. Um, the jointer that I wanted had a three, I think, three month back order. And I've heard of other people being on the back order list for Grizzly machines. The three months turns into six months, six months turns into nine months, nine months turns into a year. And that's just something I did not want to deal with. So... A little bit was kind of just saying, hey, let's try something new. Let's go with let's go with Oliver. And a little bit of it was, hey, let's, this is a company that has what I need and I do not want at all to, uh, to run into supply chain issues where I'm out of a major machine for quite a length of time. Overall, I'm very pleased. I've really got no regrets at all buying these two machines. So that's a win in my book. Um, purchase them, use them and move on with life and keep making stuff. So that's it. Uh, if you have any other questions that I did not answer, leave them down in the description below. If you leave a comment, I encourage you to do so on my website because YouTube comments with spam has just gotten ridiculous to where a lot of times commenters or, or spam bots are now stealing logos and images with a different name. You got to be careful who you reply to saying people want stuff and then they go clicking through links and if you leave a comment, I encourage you to do so on my website. I'll be more likely to respond there than on YouTube. Uh, you guys take care, have a great day, and I'll talk to you in another video.